Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Bellevue Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you for virtually joining us. Thank you for really inviting the Lord into your presence, as we can do here, um, even though we're miles apart. Thank you for the privilege of your presence. We would like to begin with prayer. And as soon as we're finished with praying, we will be hearing from the Hammond family as they are going to lead us in a couple of worship songs. Let's bow our heads. Our kind Heavenly Father, we do indeed worship you. We are grateful for your presence and your love. We thank you for the privilege of welcoming you here. Thank you for your Bible. Thank you for the chance we have to think about you, to meditate about you, and to look forward to a glorious new year. Glorious not because of what is happening on this planet now, but glorious because of the promise you provide about the future. Bathe us in that promise this year is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Uh, here we are ready to sing three songs to start this new year. So please sing with us. Let's begin with Jesus Never Fails.
last one is I believe. For the last many months, this is the face you've seen providing our weekly health tip. Richie Hammond is co-leader with Martha Hammond of our Health Ministries team. For the new year, the team is planning a new approach. Here's what Richie says. He says, Our Health Ministries team has decided to rebrand the health tip as a Strength for the Week feature. The four is a numeral. This Sabbath on Strength for the Week... We'd like to kick off the year by illustrating what moving with purpose truly is. The whole purpose of exercise and health in general is abundant living and connecting to God and other humans. The health tip will be a German pharmacy commercial that my uncle shared with the family this Christmas. This commercial does a phenomenal job of sharing that message.
Now, I've brought you right up into the pulpit here so I can show you some items. First of all, here's a $2 bill. It used to be illegal to show money on the, on the screen. I hope it's okay by now. This is a $2 bill. A $2 bill is one something you don't often see. Years and years ago, it was a common thing. But then it fell out of favor because you had a $1 bill, and if you needed $2, you just put another $1 bill with it. But in recent decades, the $2 bill has come back, and it's kind of a curiosity now. This is the only one I have. Here's something else. I hope you can see the condition of this coin. This is a nickel, but something apocalyptic or catastrophic has happened to this nickel. To batter it up, it is so battered that I see the face no, wait, that's the building side. I see the building on this side, but I can't read any of the print. On the other side is the face, but again, the battering has been so severe that I cannot read any of the print around the edges of the coin. But if I were to take this coin into a store along with some other change and pay for something with it, the clerk would probably say, oh, what's this? Is that a nickel? Oh, I guess it's a nickel. And that would still be valid U.S. currency because the clerk would recognize it as such. And here's something else. This is, used to be a penny, but now it's an oblong, flat piece of copper. Um, several years ago, I came up to one of the, these machines. I paid 50 cents back then to have a regular penny compressed and elongated into this uh, oblong shape. Little tourist, sim uh, tourist symbol. This little tourist thing says, Mount Rushmore Wall Drug Wall Wall Drug Store. Wall Drug Store. So if I were to take this into a store and say, Okay, here's something, and I use this as a penny, or try to. The clerk would look at this and say, I can't take that. That is not a penny. Now, are the, there are the same, there's the same amount of whatever it is. They have, is it copper and penny? I forget what they have in pennies. The same, the same quantity of coin material in this, but it's no longer recognized as U.S. currency. I'm wondering if you have as one of your New Year's resolutions, to be prudent with your money or more prudent with your money, to maybe invest it with long-term or invest it with eternity in mind. The bottom line is, down here on Earth, this money I've showed you is desperately needed for various things, for living expenses, for investment, for future needs, for the Lord's work. But it can vanish or be destroyed, or be taken from you, or be malformed so that it's not usable, as this coin was. Bottom line is, this is simply paper or metal when, when it comes right down to it. I hope that as you think ahead to the, to the year ahead, you will remember to invest your uh, funds toward the future, toward the Lord's work. And thank you so much for all, you, all of you who've been faithful in doing that. Um, we uh, appreciate that so much. You know how to return your tithes and offerings. As I've told you many times, you can even send it directly to the church in a larger envelope, your tithe offering envelope, in a larger envelope, or you can donate online by going to BellevueAdventist.org and clicking the word giving. Thank you for being faithful, however you choose to give. And thank you for investing, as Jesus said, laying your treasure up in heaven to uh, invest in eternal things. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to be with us financially this coming year. Our kind Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your kindness. You have sustained us. You have kept your promises to us. And we appreciate that. Help us to stand more firmly on these tangible promises in the year ahead when it relates to our financial situation. Keep us in your care. Help us to sense your presence daily. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Here in the sanctuary, it's Friday afternoon, and you might be able to hear the rain pounding down on the skylight above me. But the rain doesn't dampen our love for the Lord because we are about to watch three special events which highlight the word love. First, you'll hear the voice of Ruth Lemus as she presents a paraphrase of part of 1 Corinthians 13. Then the Mert family, who were longtime members of our congregation but who now live in Florida, will present an interesting children's story about how we can relate to each other. And finally, my brother Chester Shirk and his wife Cindy sing one of their favorite songs, Love is a Seven-Letter Word. Hello, church family. Happy Sabbath. I came across the scripture reading in a book by Ty Gibson called A God Named Desire. And this is his personal interpretation of 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And I went ahead and added verse 8 in his um, same style. God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. God is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. God always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. God never fails. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. We are back again this week and thinking about more ways to demonstrate the aspects of love that are described in 1 Corinthians 13. In chapter 13, verse 5, we are told that love is not easily provoked or angered. Love is not irritable or quick to be sharp. Jesus is the best example of this for us. When we're angry, uh, that's our uh, body telling us we have a problem that needs to be worked out. We all struggle with anger. God wants us to, wants to help us control our anger and learn to give it to him. Rylan and Maley are going to help me again this morning. Maley loves animals, so we're going to use some creatures that live in the sea to help us understand more about anger. We also enjoy snorkeling and seeing all that God has created underwater. So Uncle Jason has put together some video clips of these animals or similar ones from some of our snorkeling adventures. The first animal we'd like to talk about is a puffer fish. A puffer fish can puff up its body like a huge balloon. Do you know anyone who's like a puffer fish when they get angry? They allow anger to build up and build up and build up, but unlike the puffer fish, they eventually explode. And when these people explode, others around often get hurt. The first step in controlling our anger is to stop and notice that we're getting angry and to ask God for help. Proverbs 12, 18 tells us, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul tells us to turn to God for help with this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So he will help us to tame our anger when we turn to him and ask him for help. So the next animal we have today is the angelfish. Don't be tricked by this beautiful fish with a pretty name. When you put an angelfish in a tank with other fish like it, the angelfish tends to attack the other fish and may even eat them. Some people are like angelfish. When they are with you, they are sweet and angel-like but behind your back, they talk about you and are unkind. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27 and 29 tell us, In your anger do not sin, and do not give the devil a foothold. Do not let any unwholesome talk 
come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, and that it may benefit those who listen. So Jesus used his time here on earth to sh share the truth and build us up, and we need to do the same. Our next animal is an electric eel. Did you know that electric eels have to be put in a tank by themselves? They can release a charge of up to 860 volts, which has been likened to the pain and numbing of a stun gun, and which can be felt for some distance in the water away from the eel. Some people are like electric eels. No one wants to be around them because they're always angry and in a bad mood, ready to fire off an unkind remark. Instead of being like the eel, we need to pray and ask God to help us replace the anger with the joy of the Lord. James 1, 19 to 20 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And Nehemiah 8.10 tells us the joy of the Lord is our strength. Our final underwater animal is a barracuda. A barracuda doesn't look that scary until it opens its mouth. They have very sharp teeth that can cause a lot of damage. People who are like barracudas harm others with their harsh words. We need to stop and think before we say something unkind. Proverbs 15, 1 tells us, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. God wants to take our anger and replace it with peace and joy. Let's ask him to help us to be slow to anger and to build others up, not to tear them down with our words. How do you spell the word love? Well, most of us would spell it as L-O-V-E. But someone has come up with a different way to describe love. And this is a word with seven letters rather than the four letters of L-O-V-E. And I think you might agree after you hear this song that that seven letter word is a better way to describe true love. Lots of people think that love is spelled capital L-O-V-E But I'm beginning to change my mind Since I heard what Jesus did for me, my friend I heard what Jesus did for me Love is a seven-letter word You can guess it if you try Love is a seven-letter word Love is spelled capital F U N. But cheap thrills leave you high and dry. Your loneliness is there in the end, my friend. Your loneliness is there in the end. Love is a seven letter word. You can guess it if you try. Love is a seven letter word. Love 
love is spelled P-O-P-U-L-A-R-I-T-Y They play the game as they rise to fame On an ego trip and flying high, my friend On an ego trip and flying high Love is a seven-letter word You can guess it if you try Love is a seven-letter word C-A-L-B-A-R-Y, my friend of Calvary, it puts me to shame, for that's where Jesus died for me, glory to his holy name, my friend, glory to his holy name. Love is a seven-letter word, you can guess it if you try, love is a seven-letter This is the question of the week that we sent out for our church family and friends to consider and respond to. We're beginning a brand new year. Hooray! As we literally turn the page to a new month and a new year, aren't you thankful that we can also turn the pages of our Bibles every day and find rock-solid truth? Here's the question of the week. If you were to memorize, or write out and carry with you, a Bible verse or passage to give you courage or perspective or hope for the new year, which verse or passage would you choose? Carol Grady was our first respondent with this choice. Matthew twenty-eight twenty, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Joe Wynn says, Philippians 1, 6, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God knew me before I was born. I have sensed and experienced his presence in my life, and even though I may have wandered around going my own way at times, he continually draws me back to himself. For he is finishing that which he started in me. Amen. Ruth Lima says, The passage that I've been pondering the last couple of days that resonates with me and gives me hope is John 14, verse 6, as paraphrased in the book Finding the Father by Herb Montgomery. Jesus stated that he is the way to God, the truth about God, and the life of God incarnate. Gail Woodruff says, I didn't even have to give this question a second thought. Psalm 91. Karen Bright responds, John 3.16 God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We have hope and know God loves us. Teresa Joy says, Here are two of my favorites, especially in these chaotic times when truth and honesty are rare traits in few people, and the rest follow like blind sheep. May we not be among them, but keep centered in and focused on Christ at all times. Or as Kendra Danner signs off, anchored in Jesus. That's beautiful. From Psalm 37, He will not forsake his saints. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. 
Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. She says, For my church family I pray, Colossians 1, 9-12, I have not ceased to pray for you, asking that my church family may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He is coming soon. Let's keep the faith. From Kendra Danner Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Anchored in Jesus, Kendra. Nona Nordby says, Psalm 103, verses 10 to 14. So much good stuff in it. In fact, every word is precious, right down to verse 14. He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. In other words, he knows we are sinners in need of his grace that he gives so freely. Praise the Lord. Then she quotes, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And from Mary and Bert, Passwords for 2021. There are so many, many verses. Here are two. Habakkuk 3, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. And Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Marian Forsler says, The verses from the Bible I'd want to keep in front of me, close to me, around me, and in me are Romans eight thirty seven through 39 which in the NIV reads, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is my response, Shelley's. I woke up this morning with two of my favorite verses running through my mind. One talks about us pouring out. The other talks about God filling up. First, 
is Lamentations 2.19. Pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. And Romans 15.13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 22, 2 Kings 22. Happy New Year, by the way. I hope you're looking forward to the future with courage. We can do that because the same God who was with us in 2020 uh, will be with us in 2021 as well. I don't know if your experience as a child was the same as mine when it came to vegetables. Of course, the idea of children hating to eat vegetables is an ancient one. I know that I myself didn't scarf down the amount of vegetables my mother would have appreciated. But I think there might be a reason for that. Maybe it was just the area I grew up in. We ate a standard South Dakota farm diet, and the word stir-fry either hadn't been invented or it hadn't yet made it to the Dakotas. Most of the vegetables I was acquainted with were not served to us in their natural state. Instead, they had been seized upon and then boiled to a state of squashy softness and then buttered and salted and anointed with ketchup or Heinz 57 or something. Potatoes, I could understand, being boiled or fried. But mom did the same thing with carrots, cabbage, green beans and things like that. It was somehow like raw foods were thought of as low class foods. It's like those humble vegetables didn't qualify as real food until a cook had asserted authority over them. Nowadays, of course, we understand that most raw vegetables are not only better for you raw, but they taste better. Take Brussels sprouts. I love it when Shelley delicately roasts them in the oven with seasonings. But a couple of days ago, I went to our refrigerator and grabbed a couple of raw Brussels sprouts, washed them off, and happily crunched them down. It was like eating miniature cabbages. I loved it. So why am I bringing up raw vegetables during this first sermon of the year? Well, if I'm right, most Christians approach the new year with a resolution to read more Bible. Some like to do this by way of a through the Bible year plan. And we have one of those on our church website. And you go to our links you'll like section. You can scroll down and you'll find the Bible year plan. Other people like to read the Bible more on their own terms, taking as long as they like on a particular passage or a book or skipping over some books in order to focus on other ones. This year, I plan to kick it up a notch. And I would like to challenge you to do the same. I believe that in order to face the swirling winds of doubt and confusion and temptation, I think you and I need to read more Bible raw. R-M-B-R. Read more Bible raw. What do I mean by this? I believe that you and I should read more Bible that hasn't been flavored or processed. What I'm talking about is spend an increasing amount of time reading just the Bible, not the footnotes in the study Bible, not a devotional book's spin on what the devotional book's author believes the Bible is saying. I believe that we should spend more time without the use of Bible commentaries. Now, Bible commentaries are useful. In fact, Andrews University has just published a one-volume commentary on the Old Testament, which is excellent, which I have, and which I'm reading. But when I prepare my sermons, the first thing I do, and most of the time it's the only thing I do, is to just study the Bible. I'll print out uh, the, the, the chapter. Um, as I did with uh, this week's chapter, in several different versions, and I'll staple them all together. I I print the, the Hebrew as well, if it's in the Old Testament. 
Rarely do I look at footnotes in a study Bible and rarely at commentaries when I'm preparing my, my sermons, when I'm getting the Bible into my, my system. Mostly I just stay within the passage and see what it teaches me unaided. That's how I prepared today's sermon, as I mentioned. I also think we need to wean ourselves away from a dependence on beloved Bible teachers. While we can still appreciate them, we need to deeply study just the raw scripture itself. That's what those famous Acts 17 church members in the town of Berea did. From my pastoral experience, I can tell you stories of people who allowed Bible teachers and websites and videotapes to draw them away into a lot of crazy and harmful ideas which used up their spiritual energy and which they bitterly repented later. And this experience often left them cynical and so discouraged it was hard to find their way back home. Find, hard to find their way back to balance. Anyway, the reason I'm taking us to 2 Kings chapter 22 this morning is that it has some powerful things to say about reading the Bible raw. Let me show you, show you what I mean. So as we go through this chapter, let's just stay within it and see what we can find right here. There's plenty for us to think about in these verses without going anywhere else. By the way, at the end of the sermon, I'm going to be giving you a read more Bible raw challenge for the days ahead. Anyway, let's start with 2 Kings 22, verse 1. 2 Kings 22, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. So what do, we know, what do we know so far? We see an eight-year-old king who will end up having a nice long reign, but we also see a very interesting thing. We know his mother's name. A mother's name was not normally mentioned when kings are introduced in the Bible. But this mother's name was. And look what kind of a boy she raised. Verse 2. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. And he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. As you know, when it says that David was Josiah's father, that means ancestor. It's been several hundred years since David was alive. Josiah's real father was an evil king named Ammon, who only ruled for two years until his mid-twenties and was assassinated, which means that Jedidiah was possibly a single mom. But Josiah, most likely because of his mother's influence, behaved not like his father Ammon, but like his ancestor David. Well, so far in the chapter, we've heard nothing about reading the Bible raw, but let's keep going. We're going to discover the powerful effect raw Bible reading can have. But since this boy king seems to have David's attitude, even at such a young age, we can lay down what you could call sermon point one in this sermon. Here goes. As you read more Bible raw, Ask the Lord to give you a perceptive, receptive heart. As you read more Bible raw, ask uh, the Lord to give you a perceptive, receptive heart. A perceptive and receptive heart is what David had. And as Josiah's story goes along, we will see that he had the same kind of heart. Let's watch as that heart stirs him into action when he gets older. Verse 3, now it came to pass that in the 18th year of King Josiah, that the king sent Shaphan the scribe, the son of Azalea, the son of Meshulam, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work. 
who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work to repair the damages of the house to carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand because they deal faithfully. Talk about a perceptive, receptive heart. This king now in his mid-twenties, not much older than when his own father had been assassinated. This king is interested in making repairs on the temple. An offering has been taken, taken from the people, evidently a willing offering. And now that money needs to go into action. And to me, it's extremely interesting in verse 7 that Josiah seems to know all of these contractors and workmen well enough to be able to say that they are faithful workers you can trust with money. One of the thrilling things about pastoring this church is to see how eagerly people have responded when church renovations and repairs and enhancements need to be made and are carefully planned. You have not only provided the funds for funding these projects, but you have also indicated that you trust the people who are putting these funds to work. Thank you for your faithfulness in this. Anyway, this young adult royal is about to experience the power of reading the Bible raw, or in his case, hearing, hearing the Bible read raw. Verse 8. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. To me, this part of the story has always been really jolting. I mean, here's the high priest, the top religious ruler of the nation, discovering what are probably the five books of Moses there in the temple. This priest doesn't say casually, oh, look, a copy of the Bible. No, the way he says it makes it seem as though the book of God's law has been misplaced and not really missed and now suddenly rediscovered. Now, let's just pause for a minute and consider what the high priest and others could have done if they had been different people with a different agenda. They could have just put the book back in its hiding place and let well enough alone and not mentioned it. Or they could have come to the sing, to the king and simply summarized what it said, putting their own spin on its contents. But instead, these men are trustworthy. Josiah trusted them enough to send them out to collect the temple repair funds without worrying about corruption or embezzlement. These men seem to have had receptive and perceptive hearts. Now, this book of the law was probably not the, not the only copy in the country. And here they are in the temple, probably doing some cleaning in the storage rooms. And suddenly they discover this scroll or these scrolls, maybe it was several scrolls. And they know exactly what they need to do. Verse 9. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work and who oversee the house of the Lord. And so now they've discharged their duty. They're given a report to the king on uh, the financial situation. Verse 10. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. So here it is, raw Bible. Shaphan got a strong dose of it when he read it to himself. And now the young king is getting the same dose. Now, of course, if Josiah had been a different kind of king with a different agenda, his reaction might have been so different. If someone had read raw Bible to Solomon's son Rehoboam, as he began to rule the country after his father's death, his reaction probably would have been totally different because Rehoboam's heart 
was neither perceptive nor receptive. He depended too much on the hot-headed, spoiled young friends he'd been raised with. And he let their advice overrule the advice of wiser counselors. And of course, Josiah could have kept any negative thoughts, any rebellious thoughts under wraps. He could have listened silently and stoically. And when the book was done, he could have said, thank you very much. That was interesting. Now let's get back to repairing the temple. But watch what Josiah does instead. Verse 11, now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Back then when you tore your clothes, it was a powerful symbol of mourning, grief, and loss. When Joseph's brother Reuben discovered that his brothers had sold Joseph into slavery, he tore his clothes, Genesis 37, 29. And there are several other examples of this in the Bible. Verse 11. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Akbor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Asiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Can you see why people thought that Josiah was so much like David? David's heart was receptive to whatever the Lord had to say to him. Even when the Lord rebuked David, the king humbly accepted the rebuke and felt genuinely remorseful. Not an ounce of self-justification as King Saul often responded. But Josiah had David's heart and responded David's way. I think it's time for sermon point two. Here goes. As I read more Bible raw, not only should I ask the Lord to give me a perceptive, receptive heart, but I should also allow myself to feel the emotions God is feeling. I should allow myself to feel the emotions God is feeling. In other words, what does God get steamed up about? I need to get steamed up about these same things. And I do not need to waste all that steamed up emotion on things that aren't worthy of it. I'll just say quite frankly that I am very disturbed about something and here is what it is. Back when I was growing up, Adventists were wary about taking strong political positions. After all, sometimes we were on the side of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and other times we were not on their side. Adventists were in favor of religious freedom, and when the ACLU stood up for people whose religious freedoms were being challenged, we cheered them on. No Adventist that I knew got steamed up about politics. I was raised in a mildly Republican household, but my dad never got into arguments with people who were Democrats. Nobody else I knew did either. Adventists kept themselves judiciously apart from political wars. We had political opinions, but we voted them rather than beat other people up with them. That's why it's so hard for me to understand why some Adventists nowadays get so emotionally involved in politics. I have seen friendships strain and even separate over this kind of issue, which I do not believe God ever wanted people to separate over. Back in my day, Adventists remembered that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Adventists remembered that none of the apostles ever got into emphatic political act activism. Adventists remembered that Paul said, I am determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Sure, we knew we needed to be patriotic in the sense that we cooperated with authorities, 
if they didn't if they didn't command us to disobey God. We knew we were supposed to pray for those in authority. We were to render to Caesar what was Caesar's. But nowhere does the Bible say to get so entangled in political discussions that we waste all of the strong emotion we should be devoting to what God gets steamed up about. I think what happens to Adventists who fall into this fallacy is that they let themselves get whipped into a frenzy by professional frenzy whippers. And there are a lot of those out there. And nowadays they have quick and easy ways of shouting out their ideas, which they didn't have before. Paul took a pot shot at any partisanship, which he noticed in 1 Corinthians 3. He mentioned how some people were followers of another Christian missionary named Apollos. Others claimed to be loyal followers of Paul. Paul rebuked this partisan spirit in strongly worded terms. So I think that you and I need to walk carefully and cagily through our culture's landmines so that our eternity-focused Christian perspective does not become cramped and, to, and deformed into this or that faction or political party. Well, let's look at one more sermon point. As you remember, the king urges the men who come to see him to go inquire of the Lord Lord, about what the book of the law has said is going to happen to this sinful nation. Here's what happens. Verse 14. So Hilkiah the priest said, I'm sorry, verse 14. So Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Asiah went to Hulda the prophetess the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke with her. Then she said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods that they might prov provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. So God is definitely steamed up. And this is confirmed by the prophetess Huldah's insight. And Josiah is steamed up as well, feeling something of God's extreme frustration. But Huldah has an encouraging message for the king, and here it is, verse 18. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place." So they brought back word to the king. So here's sermon point three. As I read more Bible raw, not only should I ask the Lord to give me a perceptive, receptive heart, and not only should I allow myself to feel the emotions God is feeling, but I can be encouraged by how God treasures tender, humble hearts. I can be encouraged by how God treasures tender, humble hearts. To God, humble hearts are the hearts he responds to. After all, we need to remember what somebody has called the Micah mandate, Micah 6.8. The Micah mandate is a direct quote from God himself. Notice how the Lord brings us back to the basics of faith, Micah 6.8. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, 
to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. As I mentioned a few minutes back, I have a Read More Bible Raw challenge for you. The shortest book in the Old Testament is Obadiah. Obadiah has only 21 verses. What I've done is to take the book of Obadiah in the New King James Version and remove all the verse numbering and even the paragraph indentations and, of course, all the headings that uh, helpful Bible, study Bible people have put in. I've removed all of that. And I'll tell you how you can read this copy in a minute. My challenge for you is to read Obadiah several times and make notes on it as you read. It's going to be tempting to go to the Andrew Study Bible footnotes or search online to find out more about Obadiah and what was happening during that time. But I would like you to resist that challenge. Just read Obadiah raw. That's what I'll be doing this week because a week from today, I'm going to preach a sermon on Obadiah from my study, from the study I'm going to be doing. So I would challenge you to do what I'll be doing, looking for God's attitude in this book. What does God get emotional about? Since this book ended up in the Bible, it has something to say to us. So what do you think that message is? How can we live out the book of Obadiah in the new year. I think I'm going to send out Obadiah as an email too. But right now you can find it on our church website. Go to BellevueAdventist.org and look either on the links you'll like section or the news and events section. There you'll see a paragraph which is headed with the words Obadiah Raw, R-A-W. And that will give you a link to the book as I've removed all of the numbering and so on from it. Print it out or leave it on your screen there. Read it aloud or have someone read it aloud to you, just as Josiah heard the book of the law read aloud to him. Or find somebody online who's reading the book out loud and listen to it that way. And as you read, remember how humbly and emotionally Josiah responded when he heard raw Bible read to him. And let's learn from Obadiah and from any other Bible book we read from now on what God feels deeply about. Because that's what we should feel deeply about as well. We should reserve our deepest emotions for that kind of thing. And then next week right here, we will look at Obadiah together. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our kind Heavenly Father, thank you for Josiah's humble and teachable heart. Thank you for how he followed through on his faith and put that faith into action. Thank you for his sorrow and his agony over sin. And thank you for responding to his grief. Please give us Josiah's attitude, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.